Welcome to the AppCheck NG presentation on HTML5 uh, security. So in this presentation, we're going to be looking at some of the some of the features introduced in HTML5 and some of the security vulnerabilities that can be introduced uh, if those features aren't implemented correctly. So uh, HTML5 is quite a, a large topic and as a standard it brought in a lot of new features uh, to the web browser. A lot of those features are multimedia based, uh, designed to give the web browser a more desktop application feel. So a lot of those features are to do with multimedia and the ability to drag and drop within the web browser, um, having instant responses from the server through through web sockets and server side events. A lot of the uh, features brought into HTML5 have security implications. Uh, many of those are, are used as part of other exploits. So a popular vulnerability known as cross-site scripting can often be leveraged using the features of HTML5. Uh, certainly, when HTML5 was first introduced, one of the um, the key areas that security the security community and consultants out there talked about was this thing called local storage. So that allows a SQL style database in the web browser uh, to store much more uh, detailed information about the user's session. Uh, specific user information can be stored locally in the browser. So a lot of people around the time HTML5 was introduced thought that one of the main issues would be SQL injection in the web browser. So the ability to subvert those SQL queries that retrieve data from that local storage uh, might have been, as, as many people saw it, um, the main vulnerability that could be introduced. Um, as it turns out, um, the vulnerabilities that we've seen in, in genuine penetration testing have mainly been around cross-origin communication. Uh, and as a result, um, this is what we're going to focus on in this presentation. So our focus today will be on post message and cause or cross origin resource sharing. Before we go into the HTML5 vulnerabilities, um, we're going to take a, just a few slides to recap on some of the important technology that we need to understand um, to make sense of these vulnerabilities, if you like. And starting with perhaps um, a quite a basic approach, looking at uh, how authentication works, how session cookies are involved. Uh, it's just important that we perhaps recap on this because it's key to, to making these vulnerabilities useful, uh, to making the, the attack actually yield some benefit to the attacker. So typically, authentication works um, in a web environment by providing authentication credentials through a web form. Uh, typically username and password. The server will then issue the, the browser with a session token that, that, that is then used to identify the user from that point on. Um, that session token is usually stored in the cookie and automatically resubmitted with subsequent requests to that application. Um, session, session IDs are obviously valuable uh, from the attacker point of view. Uh, if a session ID identifies a user, being able to steal that session ID, being able to read it from the cookie, um, is a powerful attack for the attacker. If they can read that cookie, they can use it as their own cookie and then uh, masquerade as that user uh, on the application. And like I, like I say, browsers will automatically deal with this in the background. Uh, once a cookie is set, it will then resubmit it back to the application. So um, just to uh, show you a visual representation of how that works, um, here we have uh, an example application that we will come back to later on uh, when we demonstrate some of these vulnerabilities um, called Facepalm. Typical authentication system, username and password. If I click login, this takes me to my, um, my, my logged in session and some user specific information. If we go um, and look at what that looks like. So <clears throat> this is the Burp Suite proxy. Uh, it's a very common um, security assessment tool. Um, here I'm just using it for its uh, most basic um, operation, which is to analyze requests that, that my browser has sent. So if I highlight this uh, this request in the, the request history, we'll see that uh, this is the off initial authentication request. We have uh, the username and the password that I entered. Uh, if we look at the response, we can see that we have a session token set. So this set cookie header sets this session ID in my web browser. Subsequent requests to the site will carry along that session token along with the request. Therefore, the application can read that session token and it knows I'm that logged in user. That's how it identifies me from that point on. Subsequent refreshes of that page, you'll see send that session token. So perhaps one of the most um, important aspects um, of browser security when we deal with this type of vulnerability is this thing called the same origin policy. <clears throat> 
So an origin, uh, the same origin policy is a security policy defined by the browser and it, it is, its intention is to protect data. So if I'm logged into an application, such as my internet bank, uh, any data that I retrieve from the bank, whether it's statement, whether I'm performing uh, funds transfers or something like that, the same origin policy is designed to ensure that only the application uh, belonging to my bank that has been loaded from that initial URI is able to access that data. Any JavaScripts loaded in the page, they can access the data that I'm, re that I'm requesting. However, other sites, perhaps a, a malicious site opening another browser tab or another browser window is unable to access that data. So an origin is defined by um, the protocol, the port and the host name uh, of the web application. So in this slide, um, we just show how that how that's enforced. So in the example, we have www.example.com, uh, and in this table here, we we have some examples of which domains will be considered in scope uh, in the same origin. So in this case, the same protocol host name, and the port is implied here. It's, the, the default is port 80. As we can see, these two these two examples share those exact same properties. However, as we move down this list, um, this next one has a different port number, so it's outside of the same origin policy. This one has a different protocol. We've gone to HTTPS and therefore it's within a different origin. Uh, and this continues. We have a different um, host name here, different host name again. So those are outside, they're in a different origin. So when we're looking at the same origin, uh, there are two areas um, that predominantly uh, we can look at, predominantly define the same origin policy. That is um, network requests, uh, which uh, network requests we can read data from uh, in terms of if, if the browser fires up a JavaScript, makes a web request. Um, it can only receive and read responses if that web request goes to a site within the same origin. So uh, I can show you um, in along with the slides, we provided some example code and um, so if you extract the archive that's available on the AppCheck NG website and um, the sample code for the HTML5 demonstration includes a basic web server so if we just run that uh, this serves a, um, a web server on port 80 and um, so we can connect back to that in my example um, I'm going to use frames.appcheckng.com um, this is just a host file entry for that for that host that points back to local host and in here we can see the examples that we provided for this demonstration so if I go into same origin policy examples for this example I'm, I'm going to select cause and um, we're going to use this example later on in this presentation so but for now all we want to see is we're going to make a request to some different origins and see what response we get so if I copy the um, the URL, the origin that I'm currently within, if I paste that in, um, what, what happens here is I'm able to make a request and read the response. I'll just expand this so we can see it. So here I've copied the origin from my browser URI bar and we can see we, we, we're requesting a data resource from the same origin, frames to appcheckng.com and this, this lower text area shows a response to that cross origin request. Uh, well in this case we're in the same origin so that HTTP request has requested a resource in the same origin and it's able to read the response. If I change this to a different origin, perhaps um, Google. We'll see there's an error. That error is, is because of the same origin policy. Google's in a different origin. Um, this has made a request to Google, but it cannot read the response. Um, the request will have been fired out. The request is made, but the same origin policy says we can't read the response. So another component of the same origin policy is how it restricts our access to local resources loaded from other origins. So a good good example of that would be iframes loaded into the page. So many applications out there uh, may build up their user interface by uh, embedding multiple frames from different origins. Um, any frame that's loaded from within the same origin um, is accessible through JavaScript. So we can um, load up multiple frames to different parts of the same application on the same origin and we can read and we can write to those frames. Um, frames that, that live in other origins, however, the same origin policy, just in the same way as it works for web requests, for HTTP requests, it will restrict our access. So perhaps the, um, the best way to see this is via a demonstration. So if you go back to our um, example HTML code that, that, that is shipped along with this presentation, if I go to the frames section and go to the main page uh, HTML file, 
this uh, this small HTML example will essentially allow us to just embed an iframe and then attempt to write to it. So as we can see, currently loaded, um, the parent page is loaded in frames.appcheckng.com. And here in the text box, I'm going to define frames.appcheckng.com and then to a different component, but within the same origin. So if I create the frame, uh, the inner frame echoes back its origin. Um, saying it is part of app frames to app and, .com. and it can also because it's within the same origin um, it can read its parent location so in this case it's it's pointing out that it's loaded in our parent frame clicking right to frame will attempt to write hello world to this frame and as we can see that works and that works because of the same origin policy uh, it will allow us we're in the same origin the same origin policy allows us to do that so if I um, if I just refresh this page and I change the host name uh, again, these are just in my host file. Uh, this web server is running locally, but we have two entries for this same web application. But in this case, I'm changing the host name to Frames Two to AppCheckNG. I can create the iframe. You'll notice a slight difference here. Um, again, we've echoed its current um, origin. The Frames origin is now Frames Two to AppCheckNG. But however, we haven't been able to say what our parent origin is. Uh, that's because this inner iframe can no longer read that information because the external parent page is in a different origin. If I attempt to write to this frame, um, before I do that, let me open up um, the JavaScript console. I'll just clear this console out. When I click write to frame, in this case, we have a security error. Uh, the, the frame remains intact uh, and the browser has caught this same origin policy violation. And as, we, as we've been looking at, it tells us that the protocols, domains and ports must match. If they don't, so it doesn't allow us to do this uh, write to the frame. In the uh, in the slides we have uh, in the slides that you can download from the website, um, we we can we have this uh, this um, step by step. Um, so I'll just skip over these. So we've just seen this example uh, in my previous demonstration. So same origin policy is is fundamental to the security of web browsers. Um, the problem with that um, when we, is that in many cases that might not be desirable. The, in many applications, many larger applications, cross-origin communication may be required by the business. So we're seeing more and more examples of this. Uh, and as large corporations like Google and like Microsoft, as they begin to expand their, their web presence, as they expand their, um, their, their single point of um, of everything you need web-based um, more and more of these applications that they host are going to need to communicate with each other so for example uh, Google um, have acquired a lots of have acquired lots of different businesses YouTube being one of them Google may wish to to integrate YouTube and Google seamlessly with a single authentication uh, with a single login from the user so if I log into my Gmail account into my Google account I may then want to be able to aut be automatically uh, logged into my YouTube account. In many cases, um, there'll be a solution to that that's handled at the server side where sessions are, are, are shared between the applications. But as things expand, as companies acquire other companies and web presences become um, more distributed over geographical locations where synchronizing session information on the server side is difficult, client side communication becomes more more prominent and, and more important so in many cases uh, organizations such as google will use post message to load up resources from uh, other properties that they uh, they they own uh, to extract useful uh, pertinent pieces of information and then integrate them seamlessly in their in their parent application so we'll see this in, in uh, most sites, in fact, uh, the most sites that you'll visit out there will have some post message activity going on. Uh, one of the most common things is a Facebook um, like button or, or Facebook components and Twitter components integrated within the page. Those components are hosted on Facebook and, and Twitter respectively. But they also want a way, need a way of communicating back to the parent page that is incorporating those features. So an example might be a YouTube video. It may want to instruct a JavaScript within the parent page to say this, the video has started, the video has been maximized, and there's certain other features of the video being selected so that the parent page can resize and can react uh, you know, accordingly. And a lot of those things, because they're on different domains, will use post message in order to communicate. So 
Something that is a little um, beyond um, the scope of today's presentation uh, is is what did we do before HTML5? Um, well, there were a few solutions available, and, and most of them were were hacks, really, where they, they were bypasses to the same origin policy. Perhaps one of the most commonly uh, encountered technologies was something called JSONP. Um, so, as we've discussed, the same origin policy protects data. Um, uh, as it should do, you know, it protects data to stop a malicious application, a malicious JavaScript from accessing data belonging to a user account on a different application. However, resources, things like um, CSS files, JavaScript files, and image files, they can be incorpor incorporated cross-domain and used in an, used within an application. So it's perfectly fine to load up an image from an external dom uh, origin, an external domain, and have it display within the application just in the same way as you can load a JavaScript. So if you wanted to load the latest, greatest version of jQuery, you may load jQuery from the actual main J jQuery website. That's allowed in the same origin policy because we're not really, the JavaScripts are not really considered data. They're considered to be assets and part of the, and part of the web application. So they can be imported and they can be executed. We can't read the contents of a script, but we can execute it within the page. JSON P used that behavior and almost exploited it to bypass the same origin policy. So rather than pulling in a, pulling in a script file uh, and executing it, the script file that was extracted was pulled into the application um, had user supplied input, user supplied data, uh, user specific data, should I say, embedded within it. So when the request goes for the script, your cookie, perhaps if you're logged into Facebook and we're requesting a, a JavaScript from Facebook, the request off to Facebook to request that script has your cookie. It then dynamically generates a script file containing user-supplied, uh, user-specific information. When that script is then executed, it populates that user information within the page. Um, like I say, it's a hack. It was a, it was involved. It involved embedding um, client data within scripts, so smuggling that data through the the, the transmission of script files. And as a result, because it was a bypass, it, because it was a hack, it didn't really have any implied security. Nothing was built in um, to prevent a malicious attacker from being able to subvert that security. Uh, most of the time, the way it would work is there would be a, a, a token uh, in the request for that script file, for that JSONP resource, and that would then need to be validated. And that really means a developer would have to devise their own security solution. And whenever, whenever individual small groups of developers um, design a, a, a unique security solution, that means that it doesn't benefit from, from that wide level of scrutiny that you might get from a more widely deployed system. Uh, and, and often that results in a vulnerability. So as I say, this is a little beyond uh, today's presentation. JSONP is hopefully something that will, will disappear over time. Uh, HTML5 offers a much more um, secure, uh, much more neat uh, way of doing that same thing of cross-origin communication. So, yeah, HTML5 addresses the problem uh, of not being able to communicate between origins and um, the two options that we looked at earlier on in terms of network requests, um, that is handled through cross-origin resource sharing and that idea of being able to access local origins in locally uh, loaded iframes, and that's where post message comes in.